Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Kontrovich for five minutes. Chairman DeSantis, Ranking Member Lynch, Honorable Members of the Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today about the continued campaign of economic warfare against Israel. The campaign of economic warfare against Israel dates back to the birth of the Jewish state. Starting in 1948, the Arab League organized a notorious campaign to isolate Israel. Not only did they block any economic ties between themselves and Israel, they pressured companies in third countries to also boycott Israel. In the 1970s, at the height of the Arab League's boycott campaign, the U.S. passed laws making it a crime for U.S. entities to participate in the boycott. Since then, the Arab League boycott has fallen into decline and under enforcement. Part of this has been due to these U.S. laws and U.S. pressure in trade negotiations. Partly, it has been due to changing Arab attitudes towards Israel. As Arab states were increasing their trade with Israel, the old boycott campaign developed a new face. At the Durban Forum in 2001, anti-Israel groups coordinated by UN agencies adopted boycotts and sanctions as a policy tool to isolate Israel. Thus, private actors appear today at the forefront of boycott campaigns today, but the strategy is the same as the Arab League pursued, to choke off uh, uh, and delegitimize Israel. Several legislative initiatives in Congress seek to update U.S. laws to deal with the new face of the boycott movement. Part of this legislation has passed in the TPA, and another important part, contained in H.R. 1907, is currently in conference. These laws are merely mild updatings of the traditional U.S. approach to Israel boycotts. They have received across the board unanimous support in Congress. Nonetheless, some object to the anti-boycott laws because they would also apply to boycotts that also are directed at entities in, quote, territories under Israeli jurisdiction, which means West Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and other parts of the West Bank. Contrary to the entirely unsupported claims of these critics, this is also entirely consistent with U.S. law and policy. The existing anti-boycott laws also apply to boycotts of any Israeli nationals or companies, regardless of their location. No one has ever objected to this or sought to limit the application. In signing the 1997 Anti-Arab anti League Boycott Law, President Carter observed that the issue goes to the very heart of free trade amongst nations, and that boycotts were in fact divisive measures aimed particularly at Jews. He has never, President Carter and no one else has ever suggested that the anti-boycott laws be limited to Israeli companies in any particular location. Moreover, the U.S.-Israel Free Trade Agreement, passed in 1985 and expanded in 1996, expressly allows Israeli products from the West Bank to receive the same status for U.S. trade purposes as any other Israeli products. As reflected in the U.S.-Israel Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act, this was immediately put into effect by President Clinton. Indeed, there is no basis in U.S. law for disallowing Congress to apply particular laws, trade laws, or other lawful measures to the West Bank or any other territories. Nor does this contradict U.S. foreign policy. While the executive has indeed at times opposed settlement expansion or settlement construction, that is to say adding homes for Jews in the disputed territory, no administration has ever opposed business activity there. Indeed, the U.S. has long recognized that peace depends on increased prosperity and economic integration. Moreover, boycotts do not seek to prevent settlement growth. Rather, their express goal is to choke off and eliminate all Jewish presence, even mere business activity, in the disputed areas, including ones that would surely come under Israeli sovereignty in any peace deal. This fundamentally contradicts U.S. policy dating back to 1967 that any ultimate uh, parameters must be negotiated. Finally, this language, this now controversial language, is necessary to prevent anti-boycott laws from becoming indeterminate and incoherent. For example, language referring to territories controlled by Israel is necessary simply to have such laws apply to Western Jerusalem. As is well known, the position of the uh, administration and several administrations is that Western Jerusalem is not part of the State of Israel. Thus, if Congress wishes to ensure that its trade measures and laws concerning Israel apply to Western Jerusalem, language like territories under Israeli jurisdiction is needed, uh, and that is based on the administration's own view in the Zivotofsky case. Moreover, boycotts of settlements are not self-limiting because settlements are not businesses. Business is one thing, settlements are another. What about the Tel Aviv tour operator that goes to the old city, organizes a tour? That could fall within the boycott movement and European sanctions. On the other hand, we know that even, even the President of the United States has visited the old city. This is not what people mean by settlements. 
There is nothing internationally illegal about doing business in the territories. One does not need to be a supporter of settlements to understand this. Just last year, a prestigious French appeals court ruled that French and international law allows French companies and businesses to do business with the Israeli government in these areas. Finally, as I elaborate in my written testimony, the planned EU trade restrictions, which some of these measures uh, go to, would violate multiple provisions of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. Let me conclude with some brief recommendations. Congress should quickly pass House Reserve, uh, H.R. 1907 to make clear that these measures are violations of the GATT, to encourage states to continue to pass laws dealing with boycotts, and to protect United States companies from discriminatory and baseless foreign judgments based on perversions of international law. Professor uh, Kantorovich, uh, I think that you, you and Mr. Duss have a disagreement about longstanding U.S. policy, particularly this TPA provision. Um, as he characterized it, this is a, was a significant change. The State Department was right to kind of make the statements that they did. Your position, I think, is that this has been pretty consistent, uh, that we have not discriminated about particular commerce. So would you care to respond uh, to Mr. Duss? Uh, thank you. So the United States position is articulated in laws and policies that the United States has adopted. Uh, I did not hear Mr. Duss cite laws to the contrary. On the other hand, the existing anti-boycott legislation applies to companies organized under Israeli law, regardless of where they would operate. Similarly, the U.S.-Israel Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act gives the President the authority, which every President since Bill Clinton has exercised, to uh, give Israeli treatment to products from areas under Israeli jurisdiction. Thus, every existing U.S. law on the subject has extended Israeli national treatment to these areas. And Professor, do you, um, do you agree? I mean, BDS has picked up steam on American college campuses over the last decade? It does seem to be attracting more press attention, but one needs to also differentiate between college activity and the activity in the European Union, which is actually probably the most threatening. That in college, there's often lots of tumult that does not amount to much. That has been an increase but in the, attention the, in the European the, capitals, the, the, correct? Yes. I, I, would, I would like to offer an, uh, one clarification about the State Department statement about the TPA. Sure. Uh, at least in the public statement, and I think it is important to note this and hold them to this, the State Department did not say that they would not enforce the, the, the provisions of the TPA. They did say they did not like them but they did not come out and say they would not enforce them. There has been no presidential signing statement, so the natural assumption, absent such a statement, would be that they would continue to enforce it and apply it despite not liking it. Spend some time here. That might not be a good assumption, but I, t I take your point. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kantorovich, let me ask you, how much of a threat do you believe that this poses to Israel's economy as well as their overall security? The larger threat to Israel's economy and security comes from the planned measures uh, the discussed measures of the European Commission, which are being encouraged by BDS groups. Uh, in the long run, I think they uh, pose a, a real threat uh, to both Israel uh, and the viability of a two-state solution. Like Mr. Dubowitz, I would like to echo that this has a particularly strong impact on the United States. What the European Union is trying to do is to use trade, trade restrictions, and discriminatory trade restrictions as a tool of foreign relations. The central pillar of the GATT and World Trade Organization trading system, which the U.S. is the biggest proponent of, is to separate trade policy from foreign policy disputes by allowing for discriminatory, targeted, non-most favored nation treatment of Israel, it would set a precedent that would have significant impacts for a major, major trading country like the United States. Maybe Professor uh, Konarovich, uh, the BDS, are they trying to boycott regimes like Iran or the Castro brothers or North Korea as well? Not only are there not such measures against, other country, against countries with massive human rights violations and breaches of international law, I think what is important to note is even at the level of the European Union, forget the NGOs of the BDS movement for, for, for a second, even at the European level, the rules that they are seeking to impose against Israel they are not imposing even on other areas and situations where they believe there are settlements and a military occupation. Take Western Sahara, for example. The European Union, like the rest of the world, recognizes that it is occupied by Morocco. The majority of the population there are settlers. On the other hand, uh, under European law, uh, Moroccan produce from Western Sahara is labeled made in Morocco when imported in the European Union. When asked about this, European officials have said that is completely consistent with European law. 
labeling products is one thing, sovereign status of territories is another thing. Yeah, indeed, Europe has been entering into more and more treaties with Morocco, allowing them access to Western Sahara. European parliamentary documents themselves concede that Europe's treatment of Israel is inconsistent with its treatment of other, similar, other situations they view as similar in a way which is even problematic under European notions of uniformity.